Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. I have Julie Davidson on the line. She's the Trade Manager for Visit Flanders, and she's going to be talking about the upcoming events in Flanders uh, for 2014. Julie, you can begin whenever you're ready. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy days. Thank you, Jackie, for organizing everything. So I'm Julie Davidson. I'm the Trade Manager for Visit Flanders. We're located in New York City and we cover the American and Canadian markets. So it's funny, um, I'm just, I'll just tell a quick little quick funny story. People always say to me, wow, you, have, you speak English so well. And my response to that is, thank you very much. I am from Brooklyn, New York. So I'm not Belgian, but I have been to Belgium a zillion times since I've been working here at the, at the um, tourist office. And I work with a whole bunch of Belgians, and actually I am the one who has become the expert on Flanders, interestingly enough, because when they go back to Belgium, they're going home, and they're going to their families. So they don't stay in hotels, and they don't go as, to as many restaurants and sites as I do, so that when they need a recommendation, they ask me. So hopefully you guys will all do the same. So welcome to my webinar. I hope you see, oh gosh, Jackie, are you seeing my pop-ups there of my emails? Or is are that you not, there? Your pop-ups, sorry, is it not changing for you, Julie? No, okay. There, no, 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 I just didn't know if you're seeing, wait, 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 we need to go back. Hang on, hang on. No, I just didn't know if you was, I, you know, I get a pop-up when I have an email. I didn't know if you guys. Oh, no, that's, we're not currently sharing your screen. We're just sharing the presentation. So okay. on your screen, Got you can it. appear. Okay, good. I don't. <laughs> Perfect. No, anyway, so let's get started. <laughs> so Flanders, where is it? It's in Belgium, and it's, it's the northern part of Belgium, where Bruges, Ghent, Antwerp, and Brussels are all located. And to the north is the Netherlands, to the east is Germany, and to the southwest is France. The, on this particular slide, we see the darker blue area. That's Belgium as well. That's called Wallonia and that is the French-speaking part. So the part that we represent, the Flemish part, is where they speak Dutch or Flemish, and in the south they speak French. There are actually three official languages in um, Belgium, and the third one is German. There's a small German-speaking community in the south of Belgium. So just so that you know, because it's a little confusing, there are two different tourist offices in New York for Belgium. We're one of them, we're the Tourist Office for Flanders and Brussels, and the other one is called the Belgian Tourist Office. And, but actually, they don't represent all of Belgium. They represent the southern part, the French-speaking part, as well as Brussels. So everybody represents Brussels. So that's the structure there. So as you can see from this map, we're right in the middle of everything. Um, London, Amsterdam, Paris, Cologne, really, really close by. We're really in the heart of Western Europe. So it's easy to get to. And now I'm going to tell you why you and your clients should want to go there. So there are four main themes that we talk about. And sometimes I like to mix it up a little bit. Sometimes in my webinars, I'll just do a whole webinar about gastronomy or art and architecture or fo focused on fashion and design. This one is going to be sort of a more um, what's coming up. But these are the four main themes that we talk about that really, really represent our destination. Art and architecture, there's a wealth of art and architecture in Flanders going back to the Middle Ages. The whole Flemish primitives, the Van Eyck brothers, um, Memling, you name it, and going you know, forward, Rubens, and there's still a very lively art scene there. So they have a very, very long history of art in that part of the world, and amazing architecture, which I'll show you some images in a little bit. Cycling, how come? It's part of the low countries and it's really flat. So it's a perfect place to go cycling and everybody there has a bicycle and you can either cycle around in the cities or there are also cycling routes where you can cycle from one place to another. So very, very soft adventure there. Fashion and design would be primarily in Brussels and also in Antwerp. In the 80s, there was a big design movement that came out of Antwerp. They were designers. They were called the Antwerp Six. And ever since then, Antwerp has really been a center of fashion and uh, doing some very avant-garde designs to this day. There's a fashion academy in Antwerp. 
that's just celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. So that's, uh, so Antwerp is known for diamonds, but it's also known for fashion and design. And the other big, big, big theme for our destination is gastronomy. There are wonderful, wonderful restaurants in Belgium and Flanders. When people think of uh, Belgian food, they think of uh, mussels and fries, but there's a lot more to it than that. And of course, waffles and chocolate and beer, but there's a lot more to it than that as well. Um, Flanders has more Michelin-starred restaurants per capita than any other region of Europe. And it seems like these days everybody is a foodie. So for your clients that are, want to have a really wonderful gastronomic experience, by all means, please consider Flanders. So just to show you some images of some of the cities, this is Bruges. Uh, this is one of my all-time favorite shots. I think Bruges is on most people's bucket list. It's a medieval fantasy. And as we like to say, nothing has changed there in the last 500 years. I mean, these buildings are from the 15th, 16th, uh, 14th, 15th, 16th century. They're just amazing. And the reason why they're so perfectly preserved, and in fact, the entire center of Bruges is the UNESCO World Heritage Site, so it's protected. At, at some point in the, med, in the Middle Ages, Bruges fell on hard times so that they didn't have any money to like knock down the old buildings and put up new ones. So pretty much time stood still there, and we are the beneficiaries of that. It's absolutely beautiful. I mean, there are all these canals, and clients can take a canal boat ride around the city. There are five different points where you can board the, the canal boats, and they all do the same route. So it's a wonderful, a wonderful way to see Bruges. That's another shot. Then we have Brussels, which is the national capital. This is a picture that was taken on the Grand Place, which is the main square. The tall building with the tower is the city hall. And what you're looking at in front of you is a flower carpet. And what that is, is every two years in August, so the next time will be next year. It's on the even numbered year, so in 2014, they do the Brussels flower carpet, and they take about 750,000 begonias. Those are live flowers, and they're put into a carpet pattern. And it, it only lasts for a long weekend because it's live flowers, so it can't last longer than that. But to me, this I mean, I haven't had a chance to see it yet, but I, that's one of, my, one of my things that I want to do because to me this looks just absolutely spectacular. So... August of 2014, next time. This is another shot of Brussels at dusk. That's the, that tower there is from the city hall that we just saw. One of my personal favorites, this is Ghent. And Ghent is about halfway in between Bruges and Brussels. It's also a beautiful medieval town. It was built on the confluence of two rivers, the Scalp and the Lace. Lace. And um, those are really old, old, old buildings there right on the waterfront. And the reason that I like Ghent is that it has all the wonderful old medieval buildings, but it also is a university town and about 60,000 kids study there. So while it has the whole medieval feeling, it's also extremely vibrant. I mean, when it's nice out all, all along the water there, there are tables and chairs, people are drinking and eating and just having fun. So depending on your clients, what they're, if they want a quiet, you know, quiet in the evening kind of place, it would be Bruges. If they want a lively place in the evening, Ghent or both. That's another image of Ghent. This is the Castle of the Counts, otherwise known as the Gravenstein. And right now, um, you can still, it, you can visit it. It's right in the center of the city. And it is now houses a um, museum of instruments of torture. So you can um, draw your own conclusions. This is Antwerp, which is the second largest city in Belgium after Brussels. It's the it's big, big, big port city, has been for a very long time. And uh, after Rotterdam in Holland, it's the second largest port in Europe. So consequently, because of all the port activities, there are, always have been people coming and going in Antwerp. So it's very diverse and very cosmopolitan. 
And the building in the background there with the tower is the cathedral, which is absolutely magnificent. And it has uh, quite a few paintings of Rubens there in the cathedral, because that's where he lived and worked. This is one of my favorite new additions to Antwerp. This building is called the Moss, which stands for, the mu in, I'm not going to say it in Dutch. In English, it's the museum on the stream. There, that's the Skelt River, where, which is where Antwerp is located. So it's, they refer to it as the stream, which I think is kind of funny. This building houses the collections of the city of Antwerp. But to me, what's really interesting about this building is not so much the collections, but the building itself. It's fabulous. You can go in. There are escalators that you can take to the top. And if you don't go actually into the museum itself, you don't have to pay. So you can just take escalators up to the very top. And you can stand outside on the observation deck on the roof and see just the magnificent panorama of Antwerp. And there's also a very good Michelin star restaurant in the museum. This is another favorite. Um, it's the Central Station in Antwerp, which was voted by Travel and Leisure or Newsweek, something like that, as one of the top five train stations in the world. And it really is magnificent. That's where you, when you're coming into the city of Antwerp, that's what you see. It's the first thing you see. So this is one of the things that we're super excited about. If you've been to any of my webinars before, you may have heard about this. And actually, the museum is, act, is opening this weekend. So this is the Red Star Line. It was a Belgian shipping company, Belgian-American shipping company, that sailed between Antwerp and New York from the mid-1870s to about the 1930s. And over that time period, in excess of 2 million Europeans, mostly from Central and Eastern Europe, emigrated. They made their way to Antwerp by rail where they boarded the ships, and then they made their way to the United States and some to Canada as well. So what happened was these buildings were in Antwerp, completely disused and abandoned. And somebody from the city of Antwerp finally realized that they had this amazing resource there. And they set about renovating the buildings to create a museum. And the muse it's the architects that renovated Ellis Island are the same architects that are renovating, uh, that have renovated the uh, Red Star Line Museum in Antwerp. So that's really exciting. It's, it's sort of like Ellis Island, but at the other end. So it's like the bookend of Ellis Island. And I know so many people are so interested in genealogy and ancestry. So I mean, from, from being involved with this project, personally, I started doing a little bit of research and discovered that my paternal grandfather came on the Red Star Line. So that was extremely exciting. So I have a, pers a professional as well as a personal connection to the project. So this, this coming weekend, opening in Antwerp. There are two other cities that we promote as well. They're a little smaller and not as well known. This is the city of Leuven, which is where the Catholic University, one of the oldest universities in Europe, is located. And I just love this picture. This is the city hall in Leuven which to me is just like an absolute gingerbread fantasy. Um, I, I love to see this building because to me it's, it's emblematic of how incredibly wealthy this region was back in the Middle Ages. I mean, if this particular building were or something like it were somewhere else, it would probably be a cathedral. But in Flanders, it's a civic building. This is the city hall, and I just love it. Um, Leuven is also where AB InBev, which is the largest brewer in the world, they now own Budweiser and many other brands, including Stella Artois. That's where they are headquartered in Leuven. And you can do uh, factory tours there as well. And the other place that we represent is called Mechelen, which is about 20 minutes. Of, it's kind of right in between Brussels and Antwerp. It's on the, the rail line that goes to Antwerp. And it's a very charming city as well. And uh, one of my favorite hotels is there, which we'll see if I have a picture of it. No, we'll see. Come back to that. So the, the main thing that's coming up in our neck of the woods is the Great War Centenary. So from 2014 to 2018, there's going to be a lot, lot, lot happening in Flanders around the centenary. We think and we fully expect that 
the Canadian market will be very interested in this because I know any time I brought any Canadian groups over to Flanders, which I've done on several occasions, that when we've gone to the sites around Flanders Fields, it was extremely moving. And it seems like, I'm, maybe I'm crazy, but it seemed to me that every Canadian that I met knew somebody, like their grandfather or their grandfather's neighbor, or somebody that was in the war. Because so many people from Canada and Great Britain and Australia and New Zealand were involved in the war. So it really resonates. And um, Flanders figured very prominently in the war, which everyone knows the poem in Flanders Fields, which was written by McRae from Guelph, who's, of course, a Canadian. So um, the, the Flemish government is investing very, very, very heavily to get ready for the commemoration. So let me just tell you about some of the things that are going to be happening. Um, just to put it in a perspective so that you can see there in the corner there is the map of Europe. So you can see where Belgium is. The top, of the, in the little box there, the dark red area is Flanders. And then if you look at the larger map, that's Flanders. And the Flanders Fields area would be the one furthest to the west. But everything is really close together. So, so nothing in Flanders is really that far apart from each other. So I mean, just to give you an idea, from Brussels to Antwerp, it, the way to get around in, in Flanders is by rail. That's what everybody does. It's, it's very economical and fast. So from Brussels to Antwerp is about 40 minutes on the train. From Brussels to Ghent is 30 minutes. And then Bruges is another 30 minutes beyond that. The Flanders Fields area, you would access it through Ypres. That's the main touring center there. And that's maybe, I'm trying to remember, an hour and a half maybe from uh, Brussels. And it can also be toured easily, easily from Bruges. So some of you may have seen this already, but I'm going to just reiterate. I have a little extra information now. It's, um, so what is this all about, preparing for the centenary? This is a picture of Ypres after the war. The whole city was completely leveled. I mean, it was just absolutely rubble. And actually, that's, that's where tourism really kind of got started in that part of the world, because the British were coming over to Belgium, because so many of them had fought there, that they were coming over just to kind of see what it was like. And the people of Ypres had a big decision to make uh, whether or not they should re they, they were going to rebuild the city. But the question was, should they rebuild it in, as a modern city? Or should they rebuild it to look like the medieval city that it was? And they decided to build it, to rebuild it like the medieval city that it was. So this is the rebuilt cloth hall. And if you look at it, you think it's from the Middle Ages, because that's what it would have looked like before it was destroyed. And that's when it would have dated from. But actually, this building was built, started in the 1920s. And was probably, it took a long time to, to complete because it's quite large. I think it was maybe finished in the 50s. Um, obviously, World War II happened in between there. So um, this building houses the In Flanders Fields Museum, which I'll talk about more in a second. So what are our objectives? To keep the remembrance of World War I alive, to preserve the relics and heritage for future generations. And it's not about war. It's not only about war. It's also a message of peace. So there are five strategic projects that the Flemish government is investing in. And I will take you through them right now. The first one is the In Flanders Fields Museum, which I just mentioned, which is located in the Cloth Hall in Ypres. It had been closed, and it just it reopened last June, June of 2012. And it's 50% larger. There's a lot of more infrastructure. And it's a lot more interactive. And one of the things that they've done, which they had never had before, is that the tower there that you see is now open to the public so that you can climb up there and look out over the entire Ypres salient. So that, that's new, and that's pretty exciting. So you can really get a nice view from up there. So there will be things happening over the entire period, the four-year period. One of the things that will be happening with the In Flanders Fields Museum, as well as the Museum Gislen in Ghent, is they're doing a, an ex exhibition which will actually be opening this November. It's the exhibition on war and trauma. So it'll be at, in both museums in Ghent and in uh, Ypres. That's one of the first things that's opening. This 
is in Passchendaele. There's a wonderful museum there, uh, the, War, the Memorial Museum Passchendaele, and they've just ex really expanded this whole trench experience so that clients can actually go down into these trenches and see what it was like for the soldiers that were, they lived in, some of them lived in these trenches for years in just absolutely abysmal conditions. So it's a real interactive thing where you can really walk around and see what it was like for the soldiers in the, in the fields. So there's a few things that are going to be coming up at the Memorial Museum in Passchendaele. There's an exhibit next year that's going to be the Old Contemptibles. And what that's all about is the, um, the, it was a British expeditionary force, force that was over 100,000 people that it was the first time that they were, had, were, were fighting in Western Europe it was the first time in over 100 years. So they were like the first ones to go in. So they, they were referred to as the Old Contemptibles. And what it's going to, excuse me, it's going to be um, a series of exhibits um, uh, that are uh, relating to that and how they, how they uh, spent the winter there in Passchendaele when it was so awful. And I don't know if anybody's ever seen it or heard about it. There was a famous story about they had started fighting, and it was Christmas, and the Germans and the English declared a truce and had for that one day on Christmas Day, and they had a very famous football game, and then went back to fighting. So that was the old contemptibles. And then in 2015, they'll be uh, for Anzac Day, which is – uh, April 24th to 26th, there'll be commemorations. Um, that's, that was to mark the point 100 years ago when, um, when the Australian and New Zealand soldiers landed at Gallipoli, which is when the Great War uh, started for them. So there'll be a commemoration there. So, okay, so that's uh, Zona Baker, which is where the Passchendaele Museum is located. This is Popadinga, and it's referred to as behind the front. The British soldiers, when they needed to have some rest and relaxation, they would go to Poperinga, and they called it, the British called it Pops, because it was just behind the front. And there's a wonderful old house and building, which is about to celebrate its 100th anniversary as well, called Talbot House. And that's where they would stay. And you can go there now, and you can have tea there, and you can, it's also a very small bed and breakfast, so for clients who are really interested in having a real hands-on experience of what it was like for the, for the soldiers back then, you, they can actually stay in Talbot House. It's not fancy, but it's, to me, I just, I, I love it. I just think it's a really unique experience to stay there. So um, Listen Hoke is a, a, a cemetery, and there's a whole visitor center there where they talk about because that's where the, the soldiers would be treated there because it was just behind the front. That's where they would be brought. So this, the whole theme of the visitor center there is about um, treating, you know, the medical theme, treating the troops and the injured soldiers. So um, Poperinga, the train from Brussels actually goes up there. It does stop in Poperinga. It's a small town. But back then, it was a major hub, and it was a central turning point for medical evacuations um, going in the direction of France. So the, the soldiers and freight were moved um, from the front line through there on rail line L69. So there's going to be an exhibit, which is going to be starting in September of 2000. It's actually for a whole year, September of 2014 through September of 2015. It's going to be an outdoor exhibit focusing on the railway, and the highlights are going to be a photographic enlargement of a railway station and some dioramas, and it's going to be housed in a train car. So for people that are into like the whole rail thing and you know interested in that, that'll be that's happening then. This is in Dixmuda. This is the Ether Tower, which was erected after the war, so just a, a memorial to a peace memorial. So they'll, it's that whole uh, the tower and the visitor center is being renewed. So it's going to reopen in February of 2014, and it's near the. It's located. Jesus, that sounds awful. The death trenches, and there's a German cemetery nearby there as well. And last but not least, this is called the Gansaput. 
which in Dutch means goose foot. If you look at it, like it looks like a hand or a foot. You see the different like fingers there. What this is all about, it's right on, Newport is right on the coast, and the area there is, of course, very flat. And it was deliberately flooded during the war to try to prevent the Germans from getting to the coast, because the Germans were trying to make their way across the channel to, to England. So it was deliberately flooded. So there's a visitor center there, and, and, and they were stopped. Uh, there's a visitor center there where you can see the, the whole story about the inundation of the Heiser plane. So the visitor center is opening in this coming October, and you can learn all about that. And the King Albert Memorial is there as well. So there are going to be events happening in other parts of Flanders besides the Flanders Fields area. In Antwerp, they're going to be building a pontoon across the River Skelt. That's going to be um, October 3rd to 5th, 2014. It's being help, built with the help of the Dutch military, I believe. And that was something a re recreation of something that happened during the war. And there's going to be lots of different art exhibits. Uh, the mosque, that, that new modern building that I pointed out before, there's going to be an exhibit there of helping the Belgians. The Middelheim is another uh, sculpture museum and the photo museum. Like everybody, all throughout Flanders, there are going to be special exhibits ab about the war. In Leuven, which is where that amazing city hall was that I pointed out, the university, it's a big university town. The entire library was completely destroyed during the war. So um, actually, the Americans were really instrumental in helping them rebuild the library. We, um, there were collections all across the states donating money. So it was, of course, rebuilt. And uh, so that's, that's happening at the university library. You can see the, uh, the tower and the exhibition there. There's a wonderful museum there called M, Museum M, which is going to have a show on art and culture, ravage art and culture in times of conflict. So there's, I mean, Leuven's a great city anyway, but there's going to be even more reason to go there when these things start happening. And in Brussels, of course, there are always art exhibits in Brussels. Um, the Beaux-Arts is a well-known museum there. There's going to be lots of shows happening in the different museums. And it's not, not just art shows. There's also going to be choirs and lots of concerts, that sort of thing, all around the remembrance of the war. Um, in Bruges, there's going to be an exhibit about a uh, historical uh, photographic ex exhibit there. Uh, and Sophie, and I can't pronounce her last name, she's actually in the States. I believe she's at the University of Pennsylvania. So she's going to be uh, curating that in that show in Bruges. And Mechlin, which is the last city that I showed you the pictures of, there's going to be, I love this, there's, there's going to be, uh, I love the idea of this, a show about gardening during wartime at the Vegetable Museum. And the La Motte is a conference center, so there's going to be an exhibit of different uh, war artists from Mechlin. And there's actually, they're doing a musical, which I, to me sounds a little crazy. There's going to be a musical production called 1418. So. Who knows what that's going to be like? I don't know. Somehow World War I seems like a funny s subject for a musical, but we'll see. This is the Menin Gate in Ypres. It was built after World War I, and the building is a memorial. Inside the building is inscribed the names of, oh, it's in excess of 50,000 names of soldiers that they know died in Flanders, but whose remains were never recovered. So every night at exactly 8 o'clock, the, they perform a ceremony there called the Last Post. And they did, they've done it every year since the war ended, with the exception of World War II. But in July, of, July 9th, actually, of 2015, they will be performing the 30,000th Last Post. It's really a, a very moving. It's, it's short. It lasts maybe 10 minutes, but it's very moving. So this is a picture looking out over the landscape. One of the things that you'll hear often when you're in that part of Flanders is that the landscape was one of the participants in the war. And there's a question at this point. We don't know yet whether or not there's a possibility that the battlefields will be declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And we hope so, because so, much, so many people fought and died there that it would be wonderful to preserve it. 
I mean, to this day, it's a big farming area there. And to this day, it happens probably, maybe not every day, but maybe every week, that a farmer will be tilling their fields, and they'll come across live bombs. So the bomb squads have to get called to remove them. And it's, I, I mean, I find that so amazing. It was 100 years ago, and it's still going on. So in some way, the war has not ended yet. So it's so easy to get to. I mentioned this as, again, there's the map there so that you can see. By high-speed train, which is the way to do it, Paris is only one hour and 20 minutes away. My commute from Brooklyn to Manhattan every day is longer than that. That's on the Talus, the, uh, which comes into the Midi station in Brussels. London is an hour and 50 minutes, so in under two hours, you can go from St. Pancras Station in London right to the center of Brussels on Eurostar. And Amsterdam is only an hour and 50 minutes away as well by Talus, which is a high-speed train. There's a new service that was inaugurated uh, this past June. Brussels Airlines, which is our national carrier, started a new service from Washington to Brussels, which I believe operates five days a week. There's also lots of other service, mostly from the East Coast. Air Canada has a nonstop flight from Montreal, which actually origin originates in Toronto, but you have to change equipment it's, or gate. I'm not sure I did it once, but it's, so the flight is really from Montreal. Delta is flying out of Kennedy in Atlanta. United, now that they're together with Continental, has three flights, Newark, Chicago, and Washington. Jet Airways, which is an Indian carrier, has a hub in Brussels. So they have daily flights from Newark and Toronto. U.S. Air flies out of Philadelphia, and Brussels Airlines is now flying out of Kennedy and Dulles. So now I just thought quickly I'll just run through some annual events and give you an idea. Every year in Ghent in October, we have the Ghent Film Festival. And this coming October is going to be the 40th anniversary. In November, this is the thing I had mentioned earlier, the uh, war and trauma that's going to be with the In Flanders Fields Museum, as well as the Museum Gislen in Ghent. That's opening the, on November 1st. This is, these are some pictures from inside the In Flanders Fields Museum, just to give you an idea of how interactive it is. You see the hand on the left is wearing a bracelet. When you come into the museum, you get one of those bracelets, and you go to a computer, and you log in, and you put in your information, and say, for me, I'm from New York, so it'll search the database, and if there's somebody in there that they have that, you know, it could have been a soldier or whomever, you can actually follow that person's story. So it could be a Belgian soldier, it could be an American soldier, it could be a Canadian soldier, it could be, you know, a, a Belgian resident. And as you go through the museum, you touch that uh, bracelet to the different computer spots along the way, and you follow the story. And at the end, you can, you can elect to have it um, either emailed to you, or you can print it out right then and there so that you can see what happened with that person. This is a very favorite thing of mine. Everyone always thinks of Germany for Christmas markets, but we have Christmas markets too in Brussels, Antwerp, Bruges. They have some festivities in Ghent as well. This is a picture in, this is Brussels at Christmas time in the Grand Place. And they have um, ice skating, and they have a big, uh, oh gosh, I can't think of what it's called. Um, not a roller coaster. The other thing, um, oh my god, I'm not, my brain's not working. Um, oh god, you all know what I mean, and I can't think of it. A Ferris wheel. Ferris wheel that they, they erect. So there's a lot going on, as well as nice Christmas shopping. And in Bruges, they have an ice sculpture festival, which is just outside the, the railway station, where they put up tents that are cooled to a temperature that the ice won't melt. And ice sculpt sculptors come from all over Europe, and they they do these amazing sculptures. And at the end, there's an ice bar where you can have a drink. So this is an annual event. It's a big thing that happens every year in Brussels. It's called BRAFA. It's the Brussels Arts and Fine Art Fair, Antiques and Fine Art Fair. So it's from the end of January to the beginning of February. And that takes place at a venue called Turn Taxis, which is right in the heart of Brussels. 
This is not an annual event, but this is a new uh, exhibit that's opening at the M Museum in Leuven. Michel Coxey, and he was uh, the he's known as the Flemish Raphael. Carnival time uh, every year in Alst, which is just outside of Brussels, is a big, big carnival that takes place there. That's an image from the carnival in Alst. And that is Alst's claim to fame. They have a big carnival there. Another thing which happens every year is the royal greenhouses, which are just outside of the center. It's sort of a suburb of Brussels. It's called Locken. Every year, they're open for about three weeks. And the rest of the time, they're not open to the public. So that's a big deal when the greenhouses are open. And it's usually like from the end of April through the beginning of May for about three weeks. And those are, uh, that's a picture of the greenhouses there. This is another great annual event. Every year in May, the last weekend, is the Brussels Jazz Marathon, where this is another picture from the Grand Place. They erect stages there and all over different parts of Brussels. It's all free. And if the weather is fine, you can sit outside and have a beer and listen to some great music. Um, so there's jazz. And, and Flanders is a big destination for festivals. So it goes from one extreme to the other. So there's a big festival every year for metalheads. It's called Grass Pop. And that takes place uh, near Antwerp. But there's a lot of festivals that happen all over Flanders. And one of the big things every year in Ghent, that it's the Ghent festivities. It takes place for about a week and a half. And all of Ghent shuts down. People go crazy. They take off from work. There's theater. There's music. There's you name it going on. And it's just I, I haven't gotten there yet either. But it sounds like it's a really huge party. So this is the flower carpet that I had mentioned earlier, happening mid-August. And there's another picture. And then every September, over the first weekend, they have a big beer weekend in Brussels. You'll notice there are some recurring themes there, like beer. <laughs> um, so here, just to recap some of the top selling points, we really feel that there's a strong affinity for Canadians to the Great War Remembrance. Brussels, because it's a big business city, they have, they, they're very busy during the week. But on weekends, the hotels are hungry for business, and they give amazing rates. So that would be throughout the year on weekends and all summer long, July and August. So if you have anybody coming over, what I would suggest is like a place like Bruges, which is a real leisure destination. They're really busy on the weekends and not quite as busy during the week. So if you have somebody coming over and they want to go to Bruges and Brussels, the way you should structure it would be to go to Bruges during the week and then go to Brussels on the weekend. That way they'll get the biggest bang for their buck. Um, language, because it's the head of the European, the European Union is located there as well as NATO. Everybody speaks English, particularly in Flanders, extremely widely spoken. So it's a non-issue. Easy to reach. We already talked about the different carriers, so there's good lift to that part of the world. And the gastronomic experience is wonderful. And that is me. I am, I'm happy to answer any and all questions via, via email or by phone. That's our website. There's a lot more information on there. So please, please be in touch. If I can help in any way, I'd be more than happy to. So thank you again for your time and your attention. And hopefully, Jackie, if anybody has any questions, I'm okay. ready. Great. Julie, we do have some questions for you. And I invite our guests to continue to ask questions because Julie can field them while she's fielding, fielding the other questions. Um, every time I watch your presentations, Julie, on Flanders, it makes me want to go, um, <laughs> especially the Stella Artois and the festivals. And also I have family who fought in the war. So I really want to go to this destination quite sincerely. OK, hey. we have a question here from Ashley. She's curious if there are any World War I themed packages available that you know of. Well, Ashley, funny you should ask that, because I was up in Canada in July. And I had a meeting 
uh, with a colleague, flew over from Brussels, and the two of us had a very important meeting with Air Canada Vacations because we really wanted to get them on board for putting together packages. Um, so the ink is not, it, it, the, the deal hasn't been signed yet, but it's in the works. So stay tuned. We're fully, I mean, everybody, they've reached an agreement with a ground operator there. So it should be coming very soon. So I'm, my fingers are crossed, but I mean, it's, it's, so it's, it's not a done deal, but it's almost a done deal. So there, we should be having packages through Air Canada Vacations that will be on offer very soon. Okay, great. Great. Um, so we also have a question here from Duke. You've already answered this question partially. He was asking what the best flight options from Canada Flanders is. I mean, now Air Canada offers something from Montreal and Jet Airways from Toronto. For right. our friends on the West Coast, will they have to transfer from the East Coast then to get to this destination? Coming from the West Coast of Canada? From Alberta and BC? Yes, absolutely. They're gonna, they would have to they have to fly to Toronto or Montreal. Well, it really would make sense to fly to, to Montreal. Okay. Yes. Okay, great. So that answers that question, Duke. And we also have another question from Duke. And he'd like to know if you have an estimation of how many Canadians fought and perished in World War One. Oh, my. I don't have it at my fingertips. I don't know the answer to that, but I could find out. I mean, I'm sure we have it somewhere. I just don't know it off the top of my head. But if you want to shoot me an email, I'd be more than happy to find out and get back to you. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for your questions, Duke and Ashley. And if you have any other questions, that's Julie's email on the slide there. She'd be happy to hear from you. And thanks again for joining us today. And again, if you have any questions, you can shoot me an email as well at jbester at baxter.net. Cheers, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.